live. Um, and if you want to uh, tweet um, today, we're asking you to use the hashtag art of bouncing back, uh, as you'll see there on the screen. Next slide. Um, I'd like to now uh, thank our, our annual sponsors. Um, people who know ULI, especially you who are members, know um, that we're, a mem we're an organization that, that has as a, a major part of our vitality the ability to bring uh, people together in live venues for all sorts of different programming. And we've had some incredibly busy times recently doing just that. Um, COVID changes everything. We now do everything uh, virtually. And as a result, quite frankly, it has changed our ability to function from an economic point of view. So our reliance and our, and our gratitude to annual sponsors is absolutely massive. And, and so for those of you who are already annual sponsors, as, you, as you've seen on the screen, thank you so much. Um, we could not be doing this without you, and that's the, more true than ever uh, before. Um, and uh, so with that, I will move on to the next slide, uh, Denise. Um, okay, it's my, my uh, opportunity now to introduce um, the first part of our program, um, brought to you by uh, two uh, of the Artscape uh, principals, uh, Tim Jones, Chief Executive Officer of Artscape. Tim is a champion for the role of arts in playing, uh, that the arts play in transforming cities and communities. Under his direction since 1998, Artscape has grown from a Toronto-based artist studio provider to an internationally recognized leader in creative placemaking. In 2014, Tim was recognized by the Geneva-based Schwab Foundation as Social Entrepreneur of the Year. Uh, I should add that Tim is also uh, a member of the ULI Board of, of uh, Advisory Board. Asaf Weiss is the Chief Strategy Officer for Artscape. And he serves as, uh, where, where he leads organizational strategy and innovation focused on arts and culture as a driver of urban development. Prior to that, Asaf co-founded Purpose Capital, one of Canada's leading impact inv investment advisory firms, which was sold in 2017. He's been recognized as the WEF Global Shaper, a fellow of the Brookfield Institute for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, and a fellow of the Aaron de Rothschild Foundation. And with that, I will turn over to the two of you to do our front end presentation, Tim. Well, hello, and thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you, especially to ULI for hosting today's conversation. Uh, thank you also to all of you, and I see 97 now who've uh, tuned in uh, for this webinar. You know, it's easy for us to take culture for granted. Toronto culture is ubiquitous. It's literally all around us. It's collective, it's a collective creation and it's boundless. It's our love of the Toronto Raptors. It's food from every corner of the earth. It's the vibrancy of our neighborhoods. It's the experience of, in, of art in all forms. Um, and it's Toronto culture is our diversity. In the last three weeks, Toronto culture has been, it's not gone away, but it's been seriously diminished, reduced in many cases like this to a virtual shadow of its former self. The pandemic has forced us to stop congregating and it's instilled fear within our culture of the virus, but also of each other. Experts are talking about a new normal until a cure or a vaccine can be found. And a great number of the places where we've come together in the past to share and experience culture are literally struggle, struggling for their survival. Many will not make it through this crisis. Culture makers in our city are absolutely reeling with the com near complete collapse of the gig economy that they rely on for their livelihood. So I'm not here to introduce this topic to depress you, um, but it seems clear to me that Toronto culture as we knew it will never be the same. At a time like this, we gain a new appreciation of the role of culture, not only in our lives, but as the foundation of the, con the combination, sorry, for, as the foundation for the confidence in markets, and especially in an area like real estate, where so much of the value of it is built in intangible, uh, by intangible things. Art plays an especially important role in culture. Culture truth and beauty, shared understanding, and define who we are. I think Tim went on mute accidentally. 
rebuild the vibrancy of neighborhoods and confidence in our markets, really to help reimagine a new future, a better future. Uh, for those of you who may not know Artscape, we are a 34-year-old not-for-profit organization. Our mission is to make space for creativity and transform communities. Today, my colleague Asaf and I are going to tell you about a new program called Artscape Atelier. It's something we've been piloting um, for the last uh, year and a half. Uh, and we think it can transform uh, many people's thoughts of what, what is possible when we think about art in the urban environment. There's a paradigm that we think needs shaking up, uh, where we have multi-million dollar public art uh, commissions on one end of the spectrum and graffiti on the other, and not a whole lot of artistic interventions in between. We'd like to change that. And we believe that this moment, the one that we're in, uh, has created a unique opportunity for us to do that in a way that paves the way for a much better future. Asaf, please tell us uh, more about this. Great, thanks Tim and, uh, and um, welcome everybody and, uh, and hope you're all um, keeping well um, in these times. Um, I wanna take a few minutes to uh, tell you um, about how we think um, art and the urban development sector can really partner to do something extraordinary for the public um, in this time. Um, in order to do that though, I need to rewind the clock um, to uh, a year and a half ago. Um, if you could do the next slide. Um, and that was around the origin of the Artscape um, Atelier program, which was organized around this question of how can we reimagine the relationship between arts and city building? How can we turn that into a partnership so that we can integrate um, artwork more holistically into the built environment, but also so that we can recognize the real value that, um, that the arts bring to, uh, to the sense of, of place and to the real estate market. If you could do the next slide. Um, so this is a program that is really about creating um, a, uh, a platform where um, we can enable artists to partner with urban developments for the procurement of uh, both public art, but also of artistic infrastructure items. And on the next slide, I can tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so you know, what, what you'll see in, in, by way of kind of engaging with this is that um, our projects so far have featured um, the kind of familiar modalities of public art, like sculptures and, and mural works and, and um, uh, immersive experiences, but also that we've thought about expanding the, um, the canvas for work to include public realm infrastructure. Um, uh, so uh, artistic um, streetscape uh, uh, furniture, like benches, bicycle racks, light posts, signage and wayfinding, these kinds of things. And then with the third dimension really around the temporal aspect uh, of placemaking. So how do you keep places feeling alive and thriving on an ongoing basis? The next slide, please. Um, so we set out to, uh, to implement that over the, next, over the last year and a half with uh, three kind of key partners that you'll hear about, uh, uh, you'll hear from today uh, after me. Uh, and that's with, uh, with the uh, dream uh, a site at ZB in Ottawa and Gatineau with um, Argo and, and Lakeview Community Partners in Mississauga and with Daniel Zane um, portfolio-wide social procurement uh, uh, program. And this tells the tale of kind of the last uh, year and a half, but about uh, three weeks ago, as Tim said, our world, like all of yours, got turned upside down. And so we felt we had a responsibility to think about how what is a long-term ambition for the organization and, and remains a long-term program development could serve the moment that we're in. Um, so on the next slide. Um, so really, this is supposed to meet us where we are today. Um, I'm talking to you from my home. I'm broadcasting into all of yours. We are participating in a grand unified social experiment. Um, and to keep our heads cool, um, many of us, if you haven't already today, likely uh, later today or tomorrow, you're gonna go on a walk around your neighborhood. Um, and what you'll see as you do that is your neighbors doing the same thing, either walking or jogging or running. 
And all of a sudden we started to experience our immediate surroundings in our neighborhoods in a way that many of us have never experienced before with a, with a, a slower pace and with a depth of attention that we've really never had before. And as we zoom into the details, we see things like this. Um, messages to neighbors, messages to each other, messages about um, hope or healing or, uh, or resiliency or inspiration, messages of thanks. Um, and the artists among us are um, kind of uniquely capable of uh, channeling some of these messages in a way that gets directly to, um, to the heart of, of uh, people's understanding, creating a real resonance with what needs to be said in this moment. Um, but the, the thing is that these messages need bigger canvases. And so if you could flip to the next slide, please. Um, we need to think about, you know, this is really the, the crux of the relationship that, that we're proposing here between um, uh, uh, the arts and, and urban development. Um, how can we think about um, multiplying and expanding the canvases available to, uh, to our society to have the dialogue with itself that it is so desperately needing right now? So we wanted to offer uh, a few practical uh, ways that that could actually materialize from uh, the point of view that, that you're, you're coming from. Um, so on the next slide, so the, the, the first is really a kind of a familiar uh, modality to us, and that's, that's around the um, availability of hoarding. Um, the value of that is obviously that it creates an up-close and personal experience with uh, the sidewalk passers-by, but also that the length of it um, provides an opportunity for kind of unfolding stories and experiences. And these images are ones that have come about really only in the last few weeks as other cities around the world um, have started to grapple with this um, uh, uh, before we have. The second um, type on the next slide is um, really around the value of um, exterior facades. And so what we're finding is really incredible opportunities for these to be uh, important billboards in this time. From the work of Ruben Rojas in, in Los Angeles talking about um, so talking about emotional connection despite social distancing um, to, uh, to large scale mural works that um, are about giving thanks to all of the essential workers and frontline workers who are keeping us all afloat to kind of uh, temporary and dynamic lighting installations that are about reinforcing our social ethic in this time and trying to keep people uh, uh, feeling resilient. So really a, a lot of opportunities there. Um, the next one on the next slide is, uh, you know, turning our attention to um, the potential for using um, outdoor and, and privately owned public spaces. So, you know, there's a whole kind of universe of sidewalk chalk that, that is starting to emerge. Could we um, think about uh, uh, really leaning into that and creating uh, great little moments that people can, can walk by and treating the rain as our friend in wiping the canvas clean and then providing an opportunity to uh, to redraw later on, can we think about creative green uh, uh, green spacing and, and these kinds of these kinds of things? The next slide, um, and then turning our attention um, indoors, um, you know, how can we think about bringing artwork that is important in this time to public and private amenity spaces? How can we think about retooling office spaces with artwork while everyone is working from home but will eventually return? And, and perhaps, how can we actually seed artwork now um, that will be created in this time but will actually be exhibited through uh, on-site exhibitions in our spaces uh, later on? Sort of like a, a message to our future selves. Um, we think that that could have a real resonance with certainly with, um, with workforces and, and with, uh, with a, a, lot of, a lot of people. On the next slide. Um, and then, you know, the opportunity to think about um, our relationships themselves as, as, um, as canvases for, for messages. So um, this is a, an example of, of um, a gift to new condo buyers uh, uh, that came about as a result of our work with, uh, with Daniels. And could we think about um, 
could we think about uh, organizing um, artisan gifts to uh, key stakeholder groups like uh, past condo buyers, like tenants? Um, can we think about employee benefits programs to, to beautify the home office and, and to maintain a, a sense of, of mental wellness? Um, next slide. And finally, kind of working with the blank space. So, uh, you know, we're just kind of scratching the surface here. And what we want to do is to work with, uh, with you, uh, with an expanded group of, of partners to think about what the potential for um, uh, these canvases could be um, in the weeks and, and months to come. So if you could flip to the next one. Um, so I really wanna hone in on, on sort of why, why this and, and why now? Um, as I mentioned before, um, people are zoomed in on their local spaces in a way that they never have been. So the opportunity to um, show leadership in, uh, in you know, um, bringing to light messages that are important, that speak directly to people's hearts, I think is also a relationship building opportunity, um, either for the long term or in the midst of permitting processes. Um, we're also talking about, for the development sector, allocating funding that is already budgeted for, uh, whether it's in public art budgets or, or in marketing or in public realm infrastructure. And then finally, um, we know uh, the, the kind of uh, eye-opening uh, numbers of, of, uh, of work precarity in this country right now. Well, artists are sort of the, the archetype of the precarious worker, even in the best of times. We recently put out a survey to hundreds of our tenants and, uh, and member artists, and the, the numbers that we got back were staggering. Um, eight in 10 of them um, have lost the ability to earn income from, from their artwork. 40% um, of them are going to find it difficult in the next couple of weeks to, um, to put food on the table, and, and around the same number are going to find it difficult to pay rent in, in May. So the acuteness is, 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 um, is really widespread. And you know, if you think about what art budgets and art spending actually goes to, it goes to grocery bills, it goes to uh, paying rent, it goes to the manufacturing sector in the form of purchasing supplies and materials. So this is really something that could have a reverberating uh, uh, effect throughout the, the uh, economy. Um, and so, in, if you flip to the next slide, um, we, we really want to um, take a sector-wide approach. Um, for anyone kind of guessing this is in Switzerland, this is the Matterhorn Mountain, and that is a real lighting project that was put up with hashtag hope, hashtag stay home. I mean, the, the sky is the limit here. One invite us to think big. You know, what would it take to turn um, the GTA region wide into a multitude of canvases to be able to have the conversations that we need to have as a society and along the way to, to support uh, precarious work. I think that that's a really worthy challenge of, um, of this sector and wanna invite you to, to take it up with us. Um, so if you could flip to the next slide. Um, so finally, you know, if you're, if you're out there and thinking about um, how, um, how you could get involved in, and how we could explore what's possible together, please reach out to us and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Asaf. And we will send this information uh, to everybody uh, who's uh, registered uh, to follow up with if you didn't catch that. Um, I'm now gonna pivot quite quickly uh, to our panel discussion uh, led by Rob Spanier, uh, president of the Spanier Group. Um, the Spanier Group acts as a mixed-use uh, real estate development advisors, specializing in complex retail and mixed-use development projects. Over the last 20 years, Rob has worked and led development projects in Canada, United States, Europe, and the Caribbean, including downtowns, cities, colleges and universities, health and wellness districts, and destination resort towns. Rob is a long-standing member of ULI, and amongst his many roles he has held as our district council chair, um, in fact, the first chair that uh, I worked with uh, six years ago. Um, currently, he serves as our advisory board chair. And with that, over to you, Rob. Thank you, Richard. And I'm gonna be quick on making introductions because I wanna get to the questions, but I wanna thank our panelists um, for being here today. I wanna thank Tim and Asaf for that great intro. Uh, very quickly on the bios, 
Daniel Marinovic is the Chief Development Officer of DREAM and oversees the corporation's development activities in Western Canada, Ontario. Prior to joining DREAM, Dan was the Vice President of Finance for First Gulf Corporation, the commercial affiliate of Great Gulf Group of Companies, major property developer and landlord with operations in Canada and the U.S. Over the course of his career, he's been involved with a considerable list of high-profile developments, which include office, industrial, retail, adaptive reuse, condominium, and master-planned residential communities. Dan holds a Master's of uh, Business Administration from the University of Canada, uh, Kansas. Welcome, Daniel. Hila Omar Kale is the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Daniels Corporation, a GTA-based developer. Hila is responsible for Daniels community engagement and partnership portfolios, working closely with a broad range of partners and stakeholders. She oversees initiatives that look beyond the bricks and mortar to ensure that social, cultural, and economic infrastructures of communities built by Daniels are strong, as strong as the new building. Since 2009, Hila has been working on phases one, two, and three of the revitalization of Regent Park in Toronto's downtown east. Welcome, Hila. And Brian Sutherland, Director of Development for Argo Development Corporation. Uh, he's the development lead for the Lakeview Village project in Mississauga. Brian has close to 20 years of experience in land use planning and land development industry. With experience working from a municipal government planning consulting firm and land developer, Brian has a wide range of vast level of experience and perspectives towards community building and land use planning. Brian has experience working on projects across the GTA, collaborating with residents, community groups, builders, and elected officials, municipal departments, and agencies to create exciting, vibrant, and successful places. Uh, welcome, all three of you. And uh, the tie that brings all of you together is that you've all been working with Artscape and the Atelier. And so we really want to thank you for uh, taking the time to get together today. Also, welcome to the 108 participants who are here today. Uh, so nice to see the names of so many people that we know and that I know. And thank you for being here. I uh, hope everybody is staying safe, uh, washing your hands, and uh, being uh, okay with this new, new moment in time we're having right now, or as best as you can. So I'm going to jump into a series of questions uh, for the panelists. Uh, the first question will be for everyone, uh, but we'll start with Gila, and then we'll go to Dan and Brian. But as a first question, perhaps you can give us all an overview of your project or projects and how the atelier is playing a role in them. So let's start with Gila. Uh, thanks, Rob. I'll, I'll jump on uh, right on in, given the timing. Uh, so Daniels has been thrilled to enjoy uh, a partnership and collaboration of over 10 years with Artscape uh, that's resulted in uh, spaces like Daniels Spectrum in Regent Park, Artscape Sandbox in the Entertainment District, and uh, more recently, Artscape Daniels Launchpad on the waterfront. Uh, we really look um, at arts and culture as part of the DNA of our communities. So we've been working with the last uh, with Atelier um, at Artscape uh, over the last couple of months on looking at what type of social procurement we can do through the arts community. Uh, Daniels for the last 35 years has done welcome gifts uh, to all new homeowners. And so we did a recent call for welcome gifts uh, through Atelier and received uh, over 63 um, responses from artists in the GTA. Um, what's incredible about these commissions is they're, you know, small household or artisanal items, um, but based on the volume and unit counts, um, each of the commissions is upwards of $30,000, which is quite significant for an artist and an arts group. Uh, the other thing we're looking at is how to take elements of our public realm and source that through Atelier. In Regent Park, for example, we're going to have a living laneway focused uh, on bikes. Uh, and the way it's been designed by the landscape architect is these, um, the lamp poles um, in, this in this living laneway uh, actually have um, a themed topper that uh, is bicycle themed. So again, uh, reaching out through Atelier's network of artists to source these, um, what we're calling light pole toppers um, to be created um, through individual installations by artists. So really looking across our portfolio um, on things that we're going to do, money we're going to spend anyway, and doing that with intentionality. Great. Dan? Uh, sure. So um, with uh, before we get to the current project, I'd probably back up a little bit. Um, Dream and uh, you know, with its partner Cityscape have had a relationship with uh, with Artscape going back uh, close to 20 years uh, through the distillery district, uh, which goes back to uh, to 2003, and uh, within the distillery district, um, you know there is uh, there's a building called the Case Goods Building. Not everyone may be familiar with with it. Uh, sorry, I'm just getting pop-ups here as I'm chatting. Um, 
And uh, that, that 50,000 square foot building is home to about 60, I believe about 60 studios. Um, and in the earliest days of the distillery district, um, when it was just a collection of, uh, you know, Victorian era uh, buildings that were, you know, formerly used to manufacture alcohol, that provided uh, a space for artists to, to work and thrive. Um, at that time, 20 years ago, when, when, you know, artists were already being, you know, squeezed out of uh, uh, places to work and, and to live and the whole bit. So it's been, it's been home uh, to them uh, since then accordingly. Um, with respect to our current project, uh, so there's a direct parallel between, I would say, between uh, the, what we're doing in the distillery and with ZB. In the case with the distillery, you know, it's 13 acres and I think it's about three or 400,000 square feet, uh, an eclectic, you know, uh, uh, array of, of buildings. With ZB, you know, you're talking about 40 acres, uh, 4 million square feet, um, you know, future home to 5,000 residents and, you know, 6,000 uh, workers and so on. And we've got, 10 parks and you know uh, we've got we've got a it's right it's embedded in the river we've got two provinces um so i went to go and talk to the the folks at artscape to say you know how would you envision what would you think like what is our you know to use uh, a soft analogy but the 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 canvas um what would be the the, the first paint stroke on, on this canvas accordingly given the fact that you know from a magnitude perspective i mean the population of ottawa is, and gatineau is is much smaller relative to toronto yet the site is uh, is so much bigger um, and, you know, the idea of having, of bringing, actually, sorry to back up, I think that Tim actually showed a, a project of every, uh, sort of a, a collection of everything that's wrong with public art and developers um, today and, uh, and how to do things a little bit better. So uh, these are the kind of, I guess, in the early conceptual stages of, of Atelier. But the concept being of, of bringing the artists uh, closer to the development and actually embedded within the development themselves. Um, and working on a lot of things that Asaf talked about, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, benches or, you know, sewer caps or all the things that, that affect us, on, that, 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 that we're privy to on a day-to-day, -day, but don't really spend that much time really kind of, con, um, you know, uh, focusing in on. So um, within that, you know, we, we created this concept of this, this social enterprise. We have, a, a, obviously, with, with a, a site of this magnitude, there's, there's a, a corresponding budget accordingly. And it gave us the ability to really kind of scrutinize that budget with a little bit of a, of a, of a keener eye and then to start to, uh, to commission those works uh, accordingly. So uh, since that time, we've been successful at um, running a number of, number of RFPs. Uh, you know, last year we did, uh, we commissioned uh, an RFP for some, uh, for some public benches um, and, uh, and, the, and, and awarded it to, uh, to a, a local Algonquin artist um, that, uh, that uh, came up with a concept, of like, like a black bear type of concept, um, the, the Algonquin's family name. Uh, the Algonquin artist's family name was actually black bear as well, so there was a, there was a correlation that was there, and, and uh, so there's a, there's a direct tie to, uh, to the land themselves and, and the concept. And uh, and also it was, and then the second RFP that we did, uh, the proposal call I should say that we did was for for some park benches. Uh, the concept there was um, was uh, they came back in kind of like a river rock type of uh, formation, which again uh, spoke really to the river, and it was a very subtle sort of connection to to, to the river as well. And then the third was we just basically said, um, you know, to the artists, to the artistic community um, in Ottawa, Gatineau, and, and for the for the local Algonquin community, we walked them around the site and said, what would you what would you do? Bring us your your your, your best um, and craziest and, and wackiest ideas, and um, and uh, and and so we, we got a lot of the process, uh, you know, a lot of the dialogue there accordingly. Um, this year, you know, we're we're making a little bit of a pivot, obviously with the pandemic. Um, and, uh, and now we're looking to see how we can, uh, properly maybe create a bit of a connection, um, with, with what's happening. I mean, a soft walk through some of the concepts, um, you know, you know, you saw the, the, the Matterhorn and some of the, the things around the world, um, and how we can use our site accordingly to bring attention to, uh, to what everyone is kind of feeling and experiencing right now. And, uh, we think that the arts are going to have a very, very, uh, important role accordingly. Thanks, Dan. Lots of, lots of information in there to unpack. Uh, let's go over to Brian and maybe got to unmute yourself because I can't hear you. Brian, I'm not sure we can hear you. I'll give it a try. You have to either turn on your computer audio or, or press star six on your phone. Yeah. It looks like we're connected. Can you hear now? Yeah, we're good now. Thanks. Okay. Sorry about 
Um, um, yeah, I, I was just saying that. Yeah, that um, can you hear me still? Yes. Sorry, guys. Can you hear now? Yes. Okay. Sorry. So I'm just saying that, that our relationship with Artscape is, is a little more recent than that, that Daniel and, and Hila just uh, indicated. We've, we've been working with Artscape for just about a year now. Uh, but just quickly, high level uh, about our project and how it evolved into the relationship with Artscape and tying into this atelier. Uh, Lakeview Village in Mississauga is one of the, the largest waterfront redevelopment projects in, in Canada. And we're working to revitalize Southeast Mississauga's waterfront uh, at the former Lakeview Power Generating Facility site, affectionately known as the Four Sisters for, for decades. Coal burning per power plant that uh, has been demolished. Now we're working with the city uh, and the Lakeview community to reimagine this 177 acre site on Lake Ontario from its utilitarian polluting past to a new vibrant, sustainable uh, mixed use complete community. Um, the master plan was recently endorsed by council uh, is planned for 8,000 units, over 200,000 uh, square feet of retail, upwards of 2 million square feet of employment and office space opportunity, uh, fantastic uh, network of parks and open space and connections back to Lake Ontario via the Lakefront Park and a, and a really uh, amazing pier that's left over from, from the past use. Um, but also an important component of the vision for Lakeview Village has always been to, uh, to create a place and a hub for arts and culture, right? at the lake and at the head of the pier. Um, and that has been really embedded in the vision for a long time uh, by the community in Lakeview and, and by the city uh, and well before our group started work on the master plan. But as we started to, to go down the road with the plan, we were fortunate enough to meet Tim and Asaf and all the great people at Artscape. And we started to learn more about their, their great organization, what they've been doing to provide local artists with opportunities and platforms for success. And it became obvious that there were synergies with what we collectively wanted to achieve here in Lakeview from an arts and culture perspective. Um, so we, we started uh, working closely with Artscape over the last year and connecting with the arts community, working to create a vision and structure for, for this Artscape Atelier at Lakeview Village. And the, the idea is to create a permanent 30 to 40,000 square foot atelier building right at the lake, integrated in with Lakeview Square, which is intended to be the real cultural heart of Lakeview Village, uh, full of re retail restaurants, events, and this atelier would be a place for artists to work, commission and cultivate projects um, for not just Lakeview Village itself, but hopefully for projects across the city of Mississauga. Uh, and, you know, it'll have a, 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 the idea is to have a component of affordable housing so that uh, there's opportunities for artists to live and work right here in Lakeview Village. And we want to design the atelier so that it's a landmark and a destination spot and allow allow it to animate and inject um, creative energy into the community. And, um, and, and, and even prior to the construction of this permanent facility, we're spending a lot of time right now with Artscape thinking about short and medium term work that, uh, and projects that we could activate the site and generate opportunity for artists uh, as the project progresses. So we're really excited about the SLEA's vision and, and having it here in Lakeview and, and looking forward to continued collaboration with Artscape, the art community, uh, the city and the Lakeview community to realize this vision of a, a true arts and culture uh, center and hub here at Lakeview. That's great. Before we leave you, Brian, just maybe a, a couple quick examples of what you're working on in terms of the projects, because uh, both Daniel and Hila mentioned some of theirs. What are the sort of interventions or examples of projects you're working on right now with, uh, with uh, Artscape and Lakeview? Yeah, so, so as I mentioned, we've been, um, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about it in advance of this, this full-scale atelier being, being in, in place. What kind of uh, what kind of ideas or opportunities can we engage local artists on projects, both in the short and medium term? Uh, we think there's a lot of great ideas and opportunities to activate the site in a variety of different ways along the waterfront, doing something really creative with this pier that we have there, generating some buzz and excitement within the community to see some really great art projects on, you know, throughout the 177 acre uh, site and project. And, one of those ideas that we that we had had was to build on um, sunflower fields that we experimented with last year. And what we did was we planted about a million sunflower seeds on the site, uh, not really knowing how it would work or happen. But but as the sunflowers started to grow, the community really flocked to the site, and it kind of um, allowed people in the community to rediscover the site, an area that people have been cut off for for decades with, and uh, sort of a signal of something new uh, coming, uh, attracted uh, butterflies and bees and all this great stuff. And it was a huge success. So we've been thinking about how we could integrate local artists with the help of Artscape uh, and integrate projects and ideas as part of that experience. And we're also at the same time building an 8,000 square foot discovery center this year, right adjacent to the sunflower fields. So 
We also have an opportunity, as Saf was, was uh, referencing with some of his slides, to utilize the blank canvas of construction hoarding, uh, lining these sunflower fields. So, but now, you know, given where we are now with the COVID-19 and social distancing world that we're, we're all living in and the uncertainty, um, all of a sudden we need to take a step back and think about what, what the impact is to these types of initiatives and ideas and perhaps think about changes to the approach or what other opportunities uh, we still have to do something creative uh, and exciting and still have the opportunities for local artists. So we're evolving our thinking a little bit and, and thinking about how we could still provide the platform for artists to do their work, for example, in the hoarding in a very safe and social distancing way. And perhaps we could live stream uh, the creation of this artwork to allow the community to see it evolve and document it. And you know, how can we tell a story with this artwork about what's going on or perhaps the story of strength and hope that we're seeing um, across our country or, or perhaps it's a story of the past or a story of the future and where we're going and, and sort of all tie this together, document it and, and have it there for everyone to experience and enjoy, you know, once we get back to some level of, of normalcy. So I do think it's important right now to think about ideas like this and, and opportunities for artists to, to tell stories and um, inspire everyone. Because as we come out of this crisis, I, I, I really believe that arts and culture is going to be um, an important healing tool for, for us as a community and, and, and as a country. Um, and now it's a great time to engage and embrace the arts community to find opportunities like this. And I know for ourselves, um, you know, we're starting to not just think about this in relation to the Lakeview project, you know, a large master plan, uh, large scale project, but also thinking about what ideas and opportunities exist for, for all the other projects across the GTA we're working on, regardless um, of the size or location. I'm going to jump to the next question because I can't believe we only have five minutes left. And so I'll move over to Gila. Um, but we talked about this briefly yesterday, at a time when there is uncertainty about the market, and the financial systems, how can developers consider the costs associated with arts and culture? And you're on mute. Yeah, just unmuted myself. Uh, I think uh, Asaf actually referenced it, and I think it's a great one to hammer home, is, I mean, at, through development, we've got an incredible platform. Uh, Daniel mentioned it as well. We're, these are big budget projects, especially master plan communities. We're spending these dollars anyway. It's really making an intentional decision to spend these dollars and maximize impact uh, to create uh, economic benefit for artists and arts organizations. So it's looking at our portfolios, uh, at things like artwork, furniture, signage, landscaping, and thinking about how we can do those uh, differently and engage with groups like Artscape through Atelier um, and, you know, spend those dollars with maximum impact, but also create maximum impact um, in our communities. We found that anytime we do local art and um, really engage our new homeowners and new tenants in that, um, it changes the way they sort of think about home. And I think that's an important piece that we're all realizing now um, in this age of uh, social distancing is that arts and culture are not a nice to have, they're a must have. And I think we can think of our developments in that way as well. Great. Dan, I'm gonna go to you, I think with possibly the last question, depending on timing, but tell me, you know, you have a long standing relationship, Dream has a long standing relationship with Artscape. Uh, you know, dating back many years. Talk about the benefits of partnering with a group like Artscape through this Atelier program, instead of just reaching out to artists and art groups directly. Has this made it easier for you, for the artists? Um, give, give us a bit of a, a picture into you, in that window. Um, I think to some extent it, it uh, you know, it builds a little bit on what uh, Gila was saying. Um, I, I think that the same people that, you know, approve you know, uh, you know, financing and, and a whole bunch of other things that kind of fall part of your day to day shouldn't necessarily be the people that that uh, provide the approval and the direction for some of these things that really um, create that sense of connection for for the site. So I think, you know, having and, and it's important and to Hilo's point, like it's in our budget, the budgets are the budgets are substantial. And, um, you know, for it to be more impactful, um, like, let's, let's, have the, let's have the pros do it and let's have the professionals who, you know, live and, and eat and breathe and this stuff is so meaningful to them. Let, let them be the ones that, uh, that, that carry the ball and to assess and to provide direction accordingly. And, um, you know, so we've been, um, you know, obviously yeah, to, to comments, we've had a, 
a, a, a phenomenal um, track record, um, you know, going back to early days, you know, in terms of uh, curating, uh, you know, the, the distillery and, 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 and having, you know, artisanal sort of bespoke tendencies that have kind of grown over time. Um, the same thing, we're taking the same approach to something like Zibi, where we're, we're, we're looking at the little things that make a difference within the community and, le- and, having, and having them manage it uh, accordingly. And, and so far, I mean, we're, um, you know, we're three proposals in and, uh, you know, we're three for three and we're looking to, uh, to in that, and I think that's going to grow, particularly as we bring on a lot of the parks and a lot, and as we open up more of the development uh, for the public to enjoy, um, that's only going to, it's only going to compound for us in the future. Oh, that's great. Well, I think I'm just going to make a, one final comment because we've almost run out of time um, and we, we pride ourselves and I know Richard prides himself at ULI to end on time. So there may be a follow up discussion to be had and certainly outreach to Artscape and to anyone on this call. But I'd say that you know, just looking at who's on this call from across the GTA and we have developers, we have practitioners, we have so many different individuals. I think there's a real opportunity in a moment here to think about arts and culture embedded into these developments and thinking about a way to make this work, especially in light of uh, the world that we are living in right now. And things will get back to a new normal, but certainly arts and culture is an important part of bringing us there. So I want to thank all the panelists on behalf of uh, myself, on behalf of ULI and uh, great discussion and look forward to many more of these uh, and more in depth and perhaps more time. So I'll pass over to Richard. Thank you. If we could go to the final slide. Um, so we will follow up with an email to everybody who's on this call and beyond perhaps as well uh, to uh, draw attention to what can be done uh, with respect to this particular program, especially uh, in the sort of accelerated idea around the COVID-19 um, uh, physical distancing moment that we're in and, and, the, and, the, and the lingering economic impact that is bound to be uh, uh, with us for some time. Um, a contribution to Artscape is actually a very direct and meaningful way uh, to do just that. Uh, Artscape is just really the, the premier organization that interfaces with our industry uh, and the artists uh, in our community. And there's no better way during these times than to, than to make a donation to Artscape. So we really encourage you to do that. Um, and with that, we will also uh, uh, take you up, Rob, on that idea that that uh, this won't be the last you hear from us on this topic. Um, we'll be back. Um, it's important. The fact that so many people dialed in is really heartening and uh, it is a call to action. So we hope, uh, hope we uh, can see uh, some of that uh, from the rest of you as well. And many of you I know already have done so. So thank you. So thank you all. Thank you panelists. Thank you, Tim and Asaf. Um, and we'll be talking to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ruby. Thank you.